So I'm going to talk about uh, zero grazing. How many people here have ever heard that phrase before? One, two, good. Only a couple people, so we'll talk about what it means in a bit. Um, it actually is a, a, it comes from agricultural development economics, and the idea is if you have animals, as people often do in rural areas for subsistence purposes, and you let those animals just graze wherever they want, there's a good chance they'll go into your neighbor's patch, and your neighbor won't be very happy about that. So what you really want to do is either stake your animal down, so they graze a zero around the stake, that's the zero grazing, or you literally don't have them graze at all. You pen them, and you give them whatever food they're going to have. So that's a different form of zero grazing. So that's what zero grazing meant uh, up until the late 1980s. It now actually has been repurposed in an interesting way to mean something slightly different. So I'd like to start by saying I'd like to dedicate my lecture to John Pock. Um, how many people here? Yeah, you're laughing. Why are you laughing? OK, then. Um, so you probably would agree with me. He looks very nice here, doesn't he? <laughs> And that's why you're laughing, yes. He was a hard man to please. I think that's a, that's a gentle way of putting it. Um, but those of us who stuck it out with him, I think, uh, really benefited greatly. And underneath that gruff exterior, there really was a very nice man. It was often hard to find, but it was the, definitely there. Um, he changed my life. He really did. Uh, and the reason I'm here today is because of him. All right, so. Let's start with a question, what can Uganda teach us about HIV prevention? I'm going to give you the answer right away. You can leave if you decide that you are not interested in it. But in fact, the stories behind the answers are actually more interesting than the answers themselves. The first answer is that a very small change in behavior can actually leverage a very large reduction in um, an HIV epidemic. And we'll talk about why that is. Second answer is that turns out public health campaigns are very different when they come from the community, sort of bottom up from the community, than when they're imposed top down from the public health infrastructure. And the third, which is sort of you know, the, in the interstices, don't believe everything you read. OK, so Uganda in the news in 2014. This was what Uganda became known for internationally, was a very highly public legislation uh, to criminalize homosexuality. How many people here heard about that in the news? Just about everybody, right? So that was very widely publicized. They imposed a death penalty, in fact, for homosexual behavior if you were HIV positive. If you weren't HIV positive, it was just life in prison. The bill was passed in February 2014. How many people know that it was declared invalid a couple of months later? OK, so that bill never really went into practice, uh, but it got a huge amount of publicity uh, to the extent that People thought it might have some impact on HIV. Uh, that would have been extremely misguided. The HIV epidemic in Uganda is and has always been a generalized heterosexual epidemic, very unlike the epidemic that we have here in the US. But another reason people thought this, whoa, is that me again? OK. Another reason people thought that Uganda took this uh, rather extreme approach was uh, due to the influence of the US evangelical movement. And that's probably true. But the other thing that was going on that many people don't realize was there was some bad science out there at about the time that they were first discussing this bill, 2011, 2012. So in the HIV AIDS world, we got really a, a very highly publicized uh, uptick in HIV prevalence uh, in Uganda. Now, the uptick was, I think, from 6.4% to 7.3% HIV prevalence. And the data are coming from the demographic and health surveys. I don't know, how, does anybody here know about those studies? So, right, so the demographic and health surveys are population-based surveys that are done on pretty much a five-year basis in many countries that don't have the internal capacity to do health and behavioral surveys. So it's supposed to be a representative survey of the population. But anybody who's taken first-year statistics knows when you take a sample and you get an estimate of something, there's going to be some variability in that, right? So what we've got here is an uptick that the entire world was told, oh my god, the whole AIDS success story is unraveling in Uganda. And it could have essentially been within a standard error or two from a sampling perspective. 
It was interpreted as evidence that prevention was not working in Uganda. And it was actually almost a little bit of schadenfreude in that, see, it's not working. It's not working in Uganda. Uganda, which was this great success story, it's coming undone. Okay, so what was actually going on at the time? So these are two different uh, lines, one showing HIV prevalence. And in fact, yes, HIV prevalence was rising slightly during that time. But HIV prevalence is a measure of how many people are living with HIV. So if you go out and you do a survey and you test people and they come back HIV positive, it's how many people are living with HIV at any particular time. What do you suppose happens in a country when you start treating people for HIV? They live longer. So what do you think is going to happen to your HIV prevalence? it's going to go up. And is that an indication that prevention has really not worked? <laughs> yes. OK, we'll talk about that later. Um, it's an indication that treatment's working. And in fact, the measure that you really want to look at is something called HIV incidence. That's the number of new infections that you have in each year. And HIV incidence in Uganda is falling and has been falling for as long as we've got data going back. So this goes back to 1994. That's the, the first time that we actually have data that measures incidence. All right. So why was this so widely misreported? I think the first reason is because it turns out incidence data are very hard to collect. Prevalence is easy. You just go out, you do a survey. At least in a high prevalence area like Uganda, you'll get some reasonable estimate. It would be much different if we were trying to do it here because prevalence is so low, you'd have to have a very large sample. But in Uganda, that's not the case. Incidence data requires that you have, first of all, representative data. That means that you actually have to have a list of all the households, a random sample from that list, a random sample of the people in the household. Imagine trying to do that in a place like Uganda. OK? Very difficult to do. It's got to be longitudinal, which means you have to follow people over time because you need to know who's getting infected in a particular period, a year, say. So you, they were negative the first time you saw them, and they're positive the next time you see them. So it's longitudinal. That raises all sorts of questions about losing people, attrition over time in a survey. And it's got to be an open cohort so that you can continue to understand what's going on in a representative way in a population. It can't just be the same people that you follow the whole time. You've got to have the cohort be open. That's a difficult study design, extremely expensive, very different than the clinical randomized control trial that is the gold standard in most public health and medical research. Very different. This is a population-based survey. The data that I showed you on the previous page come from something called the Rakai Project. Has anybody here heard of the Rakai Project? Wow, one person, amazing. It is the only study in the world to have this type of data, the only one over this long a time span, at least. There are some studies out there now that have it over a shorter time span, but the Rakai Project is the only one that was there as far back as 1997. So I think that's the first reason why. People so rarely talk about HIV incidents because we so rarely have data on incidents that we're almost always using prevalence as our metric, but it's the wrong metric, right? The wrong tool for the job. But I think it was more than that, because good scientists could probably explain that if they needed to. What's really going on, I think, is that the declining incidence in Uganda and the continued decline in incidence implies a very different story about effective HIV prevention than the story that's become the narrative today. So zooming out to the bigger picture for a moment, there's really you, profound heterogeneity in HIV prevalence across sub-Saharan African countries. Also something that's not widely understood. Many people just say Africa. There's lots of HIV in Africa, right? But if you look, there's as much variability in Africa as there is globally, less than, way less than 1% in Niger, up to 30% uh, or more in Swaziland. The one thing that these all have in common, there's Uganda, by the way, is the gender difference. And it's interesting because women are more likely to be infected than men, about 30% more likely to be infected by men in almost every single country, including our own. That's as much gender as I'm going to do in this. I hope that's enough. 
Okay, the other thing to know about HIV prevalence uh, is that it's been declining in most countries throughout the first decade of the 2000s. So from 2001 to 2009, most of the countries uh, in Africa that we have information on for prevalence over time, we've seen a decline, and only a few of them are actually increasing. Here, again, as Uganda, notice this is from 2001 to 2009. It was 2012 where we first heard that there was an uptick. So at this point, it's still declining. And finally, estimated HIV incidence is declining. And I say estimated because this actually isn't based on data not on directly observed data, as we have from the Rakai study. This is a complicated mathematical model that generates these estimates. But the point is, epidemic seems to be going down in Africa. However, second note, starting in 2001, according to this graph, the fact is, those declines started way before 2001. And that means something because it tells us something about what was going on in HIV prevention before 2001. So the HIV declines were already in place. We don't, unfortunately, have a lot of data that can really be used in a robust way to demonstrate this. The best we have is a study that was done that took uh, antenatal clinics, so prenatal clinics, and uh, followed over time, so within a clinic, the longitudinal prevalence for, I think, 15 to 24-year-old women. So this was seen almost as a measure of incidence, right? Because you don't get this accumulation over time. And you can see how the prevalence of HIV among these young women changes over time in these matched clinics. So you're controlling a little bit for some of the population. HIV prevalence among young women had already fallen in nine countries before 2001 by a median of 25%. The maximum declines were on the order of 50%. And this, to some extent, suggests that there were declines in HIV incidence as well. In fact, our estimates suggest that incidence began declining as early as the 1980s in Uganda and also in Zimbabwe. That's a long time ago. Most of us were not even aware of the epidemic by the time it was already declining in Uganda, right? The thing to note here is that this precedes the scale up of biomedical treatment or prevention by at least a decade. So let's go back to Uganda. It was the first country in the world that we recognized had what's called a generalized epidemic. The definition of a generalized epidemic is at least 1% of the population becomes infected. That's called generalized. It was called slim disease when they first reported it. There was an article, I can't remember which journal it was in. There weren't any AIDS journals back then. It might have been a journal of the American Medical Society. First case, does anybody remember? I thought I heard somebody just, no, okay. First case was reported in the literature in 1985. And it was shortly after that that incidence began declining. So it peaked, HIV prevalence peaked in the late 1980s, and there was this campaign called the Zero Grazing Campaign that had been in place about two years before these prevalence declines began. As I said, it was an agricultural metaphor for effectively what is the golden rule. Why do you pen your animals? Because you don't want other people's animals on your place. So, you know, the golden rule is just one of those things that it doesn't matter what your religion is. And Uganda has many different religions going on, many different tribal groups going on. Golden rule is like the one thing everybody can agree on, right? So what does it mean? Don't wander. Pen your animal. All right. Now, what's interesting is you laugh, and that's exactly right. This wasn't a message that hit you over the head like, you're a bad person. This was a message that made everybody laugh, but also made everybody think. Where did it come from? It actually originated from the community, from a woman whose husband had died of AIDS in something like 1985 or 1986, at which point they began to realize it was a real problem. And people on the ground could already see who was dying, and it wasn't hard to understand the relationships, because imagine you're living in a community of, say, 200 people. You're in everybody's business. 
everybody knew who was having sex with everybody else, right? And you'd watch these people in your mental network just kind of dink, 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 hmm, okay, something's going on here, right? This was the message that they came up with after that. It was government endorsed, which was a good thing in comparison to some of the other uh, efforts that were made at HIV prevention. So it, it had a combination here of coming up from the community but also being endorsed by uh, top down from the government. And what happened was this. So this again, these are uh, mathematical model simulations with some data. So you can see the data are from antenatal clinic prevalence. Those are the dots. I should actually use this, shouldn't I? So those are the dots here. And you can see there's a rapid increase in prevalence. We didn't really observe this. All the data starts around here. But we know that there was virtually no HIV prevalence uh, as early as 1980, at least that anybody knew about. By the time we get to 1990, we've got very high prevalence in the antenatal clinics. And then we see an 80% decline in HIV prevalence in 10 years. Phenomenal, right? So this was the Uganda success story. And if you look, you can see the zero grazing campaign started here. Then you get these 80% reduction. And then you get the scale up of biomedical HIV prevention and treatment. Only 10% of this decline. So the big argument in the scientific literature during this time was how much of that is due to AIDS-related mortality. Prevalence goes down because people are just dying, right? So that you can do a mathematical model to try to get some handle on. And essentially what they found was about 10% of that decline was attributable to AIDS-related mortality. So there's really only one thing that can explain the rest. You have a decline in incidence. Yes, people are being lost but nobody knew is being created, right? That's how you get that kind of decline. The only way to get a decline in incidence at this point is behavior change. Okay, so what kind of behavior change could actually cause that? Well, it turned out to be one that our data collection and modeling tools couldn't handle, so it was actually invisible to our science. But it wasn't invisible to people on the ground. They clearly understood what was going on, and they communicated that to me in no uncertain terms when I went there in 1993. And they did it in the following way. It was my very first time going to Uganda. I was just out of graduate school, so I was pretty young. I, was the, I wasn't there with the project that had hired me. They were hiring me to do some mathematical modeling, and I thought, what was probably driving the epidemic at that time was older men with younger women. That's another hypothesis about what's going on there because if HIV it gets uh, concentrated in older age groups, then older men with younger women means you reinfect the next generation and they go on to infect their male age peers who then get older, get more infected, et cetera. So it's a nasty circle. That was what I thought what was going on. So um, I'd been hired by actually Maria Wavers for Chi Project and uh, she sent me to Uganda to sort of explain this. You'll appreciate that. You'll explain this to the masses there, right? Okay. So I'm at Makerere University, which is their main university. It's all medical doctors who have come to listen to me, which is kind of an odd group to be talking to about mathematical modeling. I'm the only white person in the room. I might have been one of two women in the room. And I'm the youngest person in the room. And I'm up here with my little mathematical modeling tools, explaining this, explaining that. In the middle of the talk, a guy in the back of the room raises his hand. Yes? Can your models handle people having more than one partner at a time? And I said, no, but nobody else's models can either. It was exactly that flip. Because it was true, nobody else's models could. And I thought, well, what, what do you expect, you know? He got up and walked out of the room in front of everybody. <laughs> and uh, I was quiet for a minute and picked myself up and continued the talk. And afterwards, you know, I got around to talking to people. So why, why are you so sure that's what's going on? Well, that's where the zero grazing campaign came from in the first place, right, was people understanding that. And I thought, okay, so my PhD was in sociology. I had a master's in stat. I was working with deterministic compartmental models, which 
there are some mathematicians in here, you'll know statisticians don't regard those as statistics. So I was way out of my element in, in any case. And I had to give up all of that stuff. I'd spent two or three years learning those tools to study this problem. And those tools can't represent this pattern. They can't represent people having more than one partner at a time. So something you need to know is the mathematical models that are currently guiding global HIV prevention policy are those tools. They can't represent concurrent partnerships. And so what they do instead is they bump up the number of partners that people have because it's the only way to generate the kinds of epidemics we see. So in those models, people have, on average, eh, 40 to 80 partners in their lifetime, your typical man and woman. And the top 10 per 2, 30 percent have about 500. You know, so one in three people basically has. You laugh, but this is big science. This is what is driving all of global HIV prevention policy at this time. And it's been doing it since 1993. So for me, because I was trained here at Reed, I chucked the models and said, OK, fine. I'm going to have to find somebody to work with who can work with some other tools. And so that's what I've been doing ever since, is coming up with other tools so that we can, in fact, represent concurrency. And it turns out when you do, totally different picture. Totally different picture of how HIV spreads. So it completely changed my research. All right. So I'm going to do in three slides here, just quickly, what's the basic intuition behind concurrent partnerships and why they matter. So imagine you've got Mr. Blue and Mrs. Red here, two different couples. In each couple, they're mutually monogamous, at least right now, as far as we can see. Both of these couples are concordant HIV negative. That means there's no HIV in this couple. Both have the same condom use and sexual behavior, let's just say. Both are in the same community, so the HIV prevalence is the same. Are both equally protected against HIV exposure? So you know this is a trick question. So this is what you really need to know. If one of those couples has a member who has a partner outside the couple, they might be connected to somebody else, who's connected to somebody else, who's connected to somebody else. And so what this does, it's really interesting because it basically means you're not infected by your behavior in a sense. You're infected by your partner. And your HIV exposure is not just determined by your behavior. It's determined by your partner's behavior, which is determined by their partner's behavior, which is determined by their partner's behavior. And what that means is it's effectively determined by the network. And here's the thing about networks. Networks have connectivity thresholds. So you can imagine a population in which about 45% of people have one partner, 45% of people have two partners, and the remaining 10% have three. The mean is 1.68. We're ignoring the poor people who have no partners because for our purposes, they're sort of not relevant for the network. You can simulate networks that have that, we call that a degree distribution. You can simulate networks with that degree distribution. And what you get are components that start to connect up. And so the largest component that you'll see will look something like one of these components. These are taken from five different networks. But they're the largest component that we see in the network. A component is a connected set. And it's about 2% of the population. So these simulations are based on populations of size 10,000. You get about 2,000. Uh, yeah, about 2% in the, in the largest component. So now let's increase our mean number of partners here to 1.74. That's 0.06 of a partner, 6 one hundredths of a partner. We've got a few more people having two partners, a few less people having one, not many more having three. Now you start to generate large components that, in general, have about 10% of the population connected. And you're beginning to see in this red circle here, that's what we call a bi-component. It's called a bi-component because you have to remove two nodes or two links in order to disconnect it. So it doesn't seem like it's that much more than one. But think of it as doubling your intervention effort. Okay. Another 0.06 of a partner. Now you've got 41% connected, 5% in the bi-component. 
another 0.06 of a partner, and now you've got 64% connected. So this whole change from here to here, 0.2 of a partner, 2 tenths of a partner. 12% more people have a concurrent partner. That's it. But 62% more people are connected. Okay? This is the lesson the, that I started with, right? A small change in behavior can generate a huge difference in the underlying connectivity that leads to an epidemic. So the bad news part of it is going from here to here. The good news part of it is only 0.2 of a partner, and if this is where you are, you can get to this. 12% of people changing behavior. Right? Powerful. The last thing, and this took us a while to understand because we didn't understand this about HIV for a while, is that concurrent partnerships interact with acute HIV infection. So acute HIV infection occurs immediately after you're infected. It lasts for, nobody knows exactly, but we think something like six to 10 weeks, not that long. It's before your immune system kicks in, your viral load shoots way up. And at that point, because your viral load has shot way up, you're much more infective to others. So the estimated probability of transmission per act is about 2%, was very high for HIV. HIV is not that easy to transmit in general. The chronic stage then kicks in. It lasts for five to eight years. And during that chronic stage, your infectivity is way down because your immune system has been activated. So you're down to about one in, uh, one in a thousand chance of transmitting per act. And finally, uh, in the absence of treatment, late stage infection, when your immune system breaks down, that tends to last for about one to two years. You're infectious again, although not as bad as during the acute phase, that's about 1% per act. And modeling studies have suggested that even though this is a very short phase of infection, six to 10 weeks, it accounts for something like 25 to 30% of incidents. So a quarter to a third practically of all HIV incidents. So think about what this implies then. In order for you to acquire HIV and then transmit it during this highly infectious acute stage, you have to have two partners during that short period. Okay, so with serial monogamy, what that would mean is really rapid partner change rates. Two partners every 10 weeks. It's about 10 partners a year. It's about 400 partners in your lifetime. That's a lot, right? So if everybody were obeying the rule of serial monogamy, it's hard to imagine that you'd ever be able to take advantage of the acute phase of infection. But concurrency means that two partners can be likely, even in a short acute stage, without high rates of partner change. Let's say you have two partners in your entire lifetime, but at some point they overlap. That period is what takes advantage and kicks in the, the sort of amplification of the acute stage. So HIV sort of makes particular use of concurrent partnerships. So what this did was it led to, uh, that's like 10 years worth of research right there. This led to concurrency information campaigns that got started before I had any idea they were going on, which was kind of interesting. Um, they were sort of started by a meeting of the South African Development Conference, uh, which declared concurrency, concurrent partnerships, a priority for HIV prevention programming uh, back in 2008 for about 13 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this led to then a regional campaign. I'm going to show you a couple of them. Uh, developed, the, the development was led by a specific uh, national non-governmental organization called Population Services International. So it was kind of a top-down thing. But at the same time, every country developed its own materials. And I'm going to show you two examples of those materials now. Ukimu ni patanji ampia humu Kenya kujeneza kwa upesi zaidi ya nje zingine zote. Nyumbani, katika ndoa kama hiyo yenyu, utafiti umetonesha kuwa karibu nusu ya wanawambukizo ukimu leo wako katika ndoa. Kwa nini? Kwa sababu mabwana wengi huweka wapenzi wao wanawamini sana hadi hawatumii kondo mkima penzi nao. Wote hudhani wapenzi hao hawafanyi mapenzi na wengine ila hawe nyewe peke. Huo ni ujinga gani? Kuna njia moja tu. Ya kuzuia ukimwi kumaliza ndoa hiyo yenyu. Raisi sana. Wanaume, tuachane na mpango wa kando. 
Mpango wa kando. Kutoka ukimwi. We never get that here, right? Right. Okay, so that's one of them. Iwe uneshwa ere kuti ndiwe weka uri kunombora mugabara kore uchi. Pamwe hausi. This one still makes me wince. Iwe unoona small house yako se uchi. Iye anoona mari yanga ite kupa kwa uri. Nevamwe warume anguwa ime chete. Kuwe na small house kuna ita kuti uwe mnetwe keje pabonde. Nyato fungi sisa usatu waenda ku small house yako nasi. Usa pinde mo network yeswe pa bonde, utziwili re HIV. Ok, so 13 countries developed a set of these TV spots, there were radio spots, there were other kinds of publications and materials that came out. One of them focused on if you have an outside partner, you're going to die. I think that, I can't remember where that one was. That got pulled pretty quick. But it got everybody talking about it, which was really interesting. And, and so, so what happens? A firestorm of blowback. Really interesting, right? Partly from the online community, you'd get comments on various public web websites saying that this is just another way to stigmatize black African sexuality. What was interesting was when this first came up, it was a way to destigmatize because the assumption had been the only way you'd get the kind of HIV prevalence that we were seeing in sub-Saharan Africa is if everybody's having lots of sex partners, right? And we knew that about Africans anyway. So this was an argument, no, they don't have to have lots of sex partners, there just have to be some overlaps. So originally it was meant to destigmatize, but in the absence of a community conversation where this could be discussed, this was the assumption that was made. This is just white folks coming to stigmatize the black Africans again. But the blowback from the scientific community was the part that really took me uh, unawares and threw me for a loop. It was completely unexpected. Um, perhaps I should have realized it was coming. I think part of it is due to this mismatch in, in paradigms of thinking. Public health and medicine have been so focused on chronic disease for so long that there's always this assumption that your individual behavior determines your outcome. There might be some ecological stuff going on, but basically this notion that you get infected by somebody else and it's their behavior that determines your outcome was a very difficult one for people to, to fall in love with, I guess. But it was way too vehement for just that. So I'm not going to spend much time on this, but those of you who are interested, those young folks, this is a great example of a scientific debate that really there was no science in, right? So there was something else going on, and I don't know where it was coming from, but it was really profound, and it became very vitriolic and very personal. I was demonized for having brought this stuff up in the first place. So that's when I think I learned the other lesson from Uganda, which is... A campaign like this really has to be crafted in partnership with a community that you're working on or you're working with. You've got to engage people. You've got to design a message with them that resonates because that's the only way you're going to survive this really toxic mix of sex and politics, and it's the only way you're going to get it to work. So I started working much more locally with uh, very specific people. I hadn't actually been involved in the PSI campaigns at all. Um, but I did uh, get most of the blowback from it. So I started working in Kenya with a woman named Kuwango Ogot uh, on something that we call the Know Your Network Project. Um, we were working up in Kasumu, Kenya, which is up here by Lake Victoria. Kasumu is home to the Luo tribe. This is Obama's people, and in fact, that's Obama's grandmother right there. And you'll notice that on Rena is... Uh, the Obama t-shirt from his first election. I, I went, for, it was like January, what is it, when, did, when is January 20th? That they're, that, that you're inaugurated? Okay, so it, like that was January 20th, I was in Washington DC for the inauguration and January 24th I was sitting here with Obama's grandmother um, and I'd given Rena that t-shirt. So, they have the highest HIV prevalence in Kenya. The Siaya district, which is where we were working, had 18% prevalence versus 2% in the rest of the country. So remember, again, people think, oh, Africa has HIV. It's not just Africa. It's some countries in Africa. You think Kenya has HIV. It's not all of Kenya. Most of Kenya has no HIV at all. It's almost all concentrated in these two spots. What's going on, right? Okay. 
So that's Obama's grandma. <laughs> so this started, actually, I, was, I, I had been involved in this project even before we kind of started working on the concurrency part. Um, it was a project on widow inheritance, which if you think about it, is a form of concurrency. So a woman dies, she's inherited by her brother-in-law who might already have a wife, uh, so it becomes uh, a concurrent partnership. It's a very complex uh, cultural tradition in this particular community that's connected with rituals of spousal sexual behavior that are timed around specific community events, in particular births, deaths, planting, and harvesting. And if people don't engage in sex, it's thought to bring bad luck on the entire community. So it's kind of an interesting uh, process. But what we ended up finding was that concurrency was also common outside of the widow inheritance context. So when we went back to disseminate the results of this study to these nine communities where people had participated, um, this led to some interesting discussions because we wanted to explain how concurrency worked and what impact it was having in their communities. So what we did was uh, a hand-holding exercise, which we thought of on the bumpy van ride out to the first village, like, how are we going to explain this? Oh, I've got an idea. OK, so the hand-holding exercise is this. I do it with people, except there, there aren't quite enough here. So imagine that you get the first, the first place that, well, OK. Imagine you get 10 people up here, and you do two rows of five. And then you ask people to hold hands with the person across from them. They have an idea of who that partner is. Then you take the person at the end of one of the lines, shift them up to the beginning of this line, scooch everybody down. Now hold hands with the person across from you. OK. So how many partners has everybody had in this? Two. And if I randomly infect one person, how many additional people will become exposed? Three. Right. Because there is, so if I'm the one who's infected, there's my first partner, then there'll be my second partner, but my first partner has gone on and had another partner. Okay, so four total, the original person and three others. Now imagine that you have everybody in this group hold hands in a big circle. How many partners does everybody have? Two. Same as before. How many people are now exposed? Everyone. Doesn't matter how many people you put in that circle, everyone is. You can make those lines 100 people, 100 people, you still only get four people. Right? That's the power of concurrency. So what we did was we ran this little hand-holding exercise, and instead of telling them what the answer is, we asked the question, so how many people are exposed? How many partners do you have? When they see the difference, it's like, okay, what's the difference due to? Why the difference? And then you just wait. And it takes usually 30 to 60 seconds for somebody to perfectly articulate it's because we're having two partners at the same time. And that's what you want. And that's different than having two partners one after the other. And this is what the difference is. Everybody gets that. You can play that game in a kindergartner school for the flu, obviously not for HIV, and people will get that. And then you say, and it doesn't take very much concurrency. I mean, here everybody had two partners, right? That means everybody's got a concurrent partner. So how much concurrency does it really take to put a network together? And then you show them this four-panel graphic, which is you know, a mathematical tour de force to reproduce. But it communicates in a very clear, simple way, as soon as you've done that hand-holding exercises, exactly how quickly a network gets connected. Only 12% of people have to change behavior, right? So we did this in the first, whatever, six, seven communities. And it was really interesting. So the first community I tried to do it in, I tried, there were about 100 people at the dissemination event. I tried getting all of them involved in the hand-holding exercise, so that didn't work very well. And then the next ones I did it you know, with 10 people, that worked really well. Very engaged, very interesting. And I could see people sort of going, oh, that's why you asked us all those weird questions on that survey. Now, I, if I'd known that, I would have told you the truth, <laughs> right? I literally felt that, though, from them. And so 
by the last two communities, they were also so interested in this graphic, and I had this sense that they were looking at, oh, I, know, I know where I am in that, right? So I started having votes saying, okay, so which one of these networks do you think is the network in your community? How many people think it's network number one? Maybe one person would raise their hand. How many people think it's network number two? Two or three might raise their hand. Network number three, everybody raises their hand. Network number four, maybe one or two people. So they're not going all the way to the end. They really think it's network number three. In both of the communities where I tried that, they both thought it was community number three, or network number three, and I thought, and they probably know. That's the other thing, they probably do know this. So what I can do is, once I get them to this point, I can say, do you wanna know what your network looks like? So here's what we need to do if you wanna know what your network looks like. I've got these little handheld devices. We're just gonna ask you nine questions. We're not gonna ask your name, but we're gonna ask you about the most recent three sex partners you had, the dates, first sex and last sex, and whether you expect to have sex again. That's it. I'm not gonna ask your partner's name either. Don't wanna know any names. But you give me that, I've got my degree distribution. I can simulate the networks and show you what the network looks like. And I can do it right now. Because these handheld PDAs mean it'll take me about an hour to collect the data from you guys. Um, we have like 10 people who are their research assistants doing that. We download it all to a central laptop. We run the simulation. Bang, there it is. You interested? People were very interested. Right. So that is really engaging the community in your research and giving them the results immediately because these results are not for me to take to a journal so I can get tenure. These results are so that you understand what's going on in your community and you make your decisions from there. I'm not gonna tell you what to do about that, but at least you'll get to see it. So that was the insight that I got from the community taking this message uh, on widow inheritance out, and it led to this intervention. And as we developed the intervention, we involved the community in, so do you think this will work? Do you think that'll work? We did these focus groups with them. We used, uh, they have a indigenous sort of monthly meeting they call the Barasa, that the, all of the adults uh, get together. So we would go to the Barasa with it and say, well, what do you think about this? Do you think this intervention will work? And we involved them in evaluating it afterwards. And we ran a little trial of this, and the qualitative results were amazing. Overwhelming enthusiasm for the inter intervention. One of the older men in the focus group discussion said, this is the medicine. This is the medicine we've been waiting for. We have people coming through this community all the time saying, you gotta do this for HIV, you gotta do that for HIV, you gotta use this, you gotta stop doing that, you gotta eat this, you gotta sleep more, whatever. This is the first thing I've heard that makes any sense. And we got a request from the adults in every one of the focus groups that we ran that we please develop a version of this for their kids, their adolescents, right? So we have some quantitative results, although they're much more limited. We got higher levels of partner disclosure in the trial that we ran, the single trial that we ran. 31% of men and 18% of women reported concurrent partners in this anonymous form in the last year when we showed them what the result was, compared to 10% and 1% in the DHS. So people are feeling more comfortable disclosing this behavior when they know it's gonna mean something useful for them. And we have some evidence of efficacy from a subsequent very small pilot forearm trial the problem is, so we saw concurrency changes for men in the KYN communities, pre versus post. And the problem is they started higher, and then they came down lower. So the, it's a little hard to say you know, how to interpret those results, but it was a very small trial in any case. So that was example one. And then much closer to home, uh, we developed a concurrency messaging project uh, here in Seattle. And the motivation here is the profound racial disparities and HIV prevalence that we have in the US. So if you look at heterosexually acquired HIV infections, the rate per 100,000, uh, for non-Hispanic black women, so much higher than everybody else. In both cases, the women have higher rates than men, non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. So I guess I talked about gender twice. Um, but the amazing thing here is, I mean, you really gotta wrap your head around this. So, so a non-Hispanic black woman is five times more likely to become infected with HIV than a non-Hispanic white woman. 44 times more likely than a white man. Heterosexually, not 
from men who have sex with men, right? So this is heterosexually acquired infection, 44 times more likely to become infected than a white man. I mean, th those numbers are just insane, right? Okay. So we had a long interactive process with the community up in Seattle about this, which actually started, I would say, back in 1994 when I was in Uganda and the guy walked out of the room. So 10 years after that, I was working on things. By 2006, our uh, Center for AIDS Research had established what we called a community action board as opposed to a community advisory board to engage our community in research. And the first thing that we did was we put on a workshop on these disparities because the disparities were quite large in Seattle as well. In the morning, there were four research presentations, including one by me. In the afternoon, a community discussion about what to do about it. And what they wanted to do was have a concurrency messaging campaign because nobody had ever seen this before and it made sense to them. So they started the disparities working group. And we then got a NIH grant to fund that. That led to message development in 2009 through 11. That was a long period of going to the community and trying to come up with something like zero grazing for local people. Zero grazing doesn't mean anything to people here, right? But what could you do that would have the same sort of impact? It would be funny rather than nasty. It would appeal to people's better sides, but it would also be informative. So we did project evaluation and dissemination uh, then after that. So here's what they came up with. This is our version of the PSI campaign now, right? So we don't have a lot of money. We can't make a whole video. We're making these little palm cards that we'll leave at, at clubs and businesses and other things. Um, this is what they came up with, and I honestly, I, I felt a little uncomfortable with it. And so I conveyed that, uh, that back to them, and they said, okay, fine. We won't, call it, we won't say it's killing us. We'll just say it's spreading infection. Okay, so that feels like it's a little bit more toned down, right? Because I think that just would have had a very negative uh, sort of reaction in the community. Even though it was brought up by the community, I still felt uncomfortable. Okay, then we go out. We want Clear Channel to uh, allow us to use these advertisements on buses and rail transit, the little rail transit we have in Seattle. Clear Channel required some more changes. They didn't like that first person phrasing. They wanted us to say, he has two girlfriends and he has unprotected sex with both of them, which I thought was a horrible idea because that's like, it's not me. All of a sudden, it's he has it, right? And then it is stigmatizing, right? The community group, it wasn't my decision. Community group said, whatever. We're going, if Clear Channel, I know. If Clear Channel will take it, we'll put it, we'll use it. At the end, after we made all the changes, after we'd printed up all the cards, they refused to use the ads. Calling them lewd and lascivious, which they could have told us in the beginning and we would have gone away. But they kept the money. That was the most amazing thing. So this whole thing ended up as a grassroots campaign rather than a mass media campaign. And that turned out to have some interesting impacts as well. So yes, we got some backlash once we sent this out there. It was in the white community press. It started with a stranger. Lots of people here, I think, know the stranger. And then made it over to Crosscut. Um, what was ironic about all this was it was only the white community press that got upset. And they assumed the message had been developed by white academics, which it hadn't, right? And they concluded that, therefore, it was racist and stigmatizing. So what we did, we, we just trotted out the community action board folks that had been involved and the leader of the project, who was an African American. It's like, nope, wasn't that. Here are the guys who were so upset. OK. All right, so I've learned a lot here. Anyway, so what did the community think? I mean, at the end of the day, it was them that we were really interested in. Well, the campaign was evaluated with a street intercept survey of about 100 persons. Uh, not a lot, but still interesting where the flyers and posters had been distributed. And what we found was people liked the, the campaign. They thought it had visual appeal. It was interesting. It was important to them. It was important to the community. And overall, they just thought it was good. 85 to 95% liked it. In terms of impact, 60 to 80% said it had an impact on them personally. It either changed their knowledge, their attitudes, or their intention to change behavior. 
And finally, the most interesting part was where did they hear about it? Because not everybody got a palm card, right? In fact, as it turns out, 80% of people heard it through their social network. They heard somebody talk about it, which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to start a discussion. That was the whole purpose of this. And all the money that we had spent on posters and business things, and we had some newspaper ads in uh, the local community press for various African-American immigrant communities, we had one TV spot and a big effort for a website that nobody looked at. Good. The social network part worked. All right. So as in Uganda, I would say clearly the community participation was essential. So now we're in this great place. We have these two beautiful sort of pilot projects, but unfortunately the ship has sailed in a very different direction. Basically, HIV prevention at this point is all focused on biomedical approaches. Treatment is prevention, which is a great thing because it turns out if you treat somebody, not only is it good for them, it reduces their viral load, so it means they're less likely to transmit to others. Excellent idea. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, which they are now rolling out as hard as they can, the drug companies love this because the thing about treatment is prevention is you have to wait till somebody gets HIV infected, and there aren't that many people who are HIV infected. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is all the uninfected. All of you, in order not to get HIV, take a pill every day. That's the idea. Right. It's the same pills that we're using for treatment, but we can't even get treatment to various countries in sub-Saharan Africa to the populations that need it. And now we're going to start using it instead for PrEP. Okay. All right. So that's where we are in terms of HIV prevention. If you look at the the most recent guidelines for HIV prevention that have come out of the White House does not mention behavior, except for adherence to drugs. That's the only behavior that we care about. And we're going to get rid of HIV AIDS just by using these drugs, it turns out, at least if you believe the mathematical models. And the mathematical models have been persuasive enough, although I've told you about them, They've been persuasive enough that everybody thinks now we are going to get rid of HIV. In fact, our governor has issued a proclamation. Uh, so did the governor of the state of New York. Proclamations for the end of AIDS, politically. I'm going to say it, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen by 2020. Yeah, some people are looking a little shocked, others are laughing, exactly. This is where we are. So it's like I, co I completely missed the boat, right? I, I, have, I can only laugh at this, except it's not funny. So the last lesson, whether or not this purely biomedical strategy will work to end HIV, what I know is Uganda's epidemic is still declining, and it's declining in exactly the way that I would expect if they were just below that connectivity threshold, a slow, steady, every generation is a little bit smaller than the next, right? So at least that's still going on. We're going to be spending an insane amount of money on drugs. And some of that's going to be great, because people need treatment. But I think as well, we now have a new set of tools for understanding why these declines might be happening. And we may need those tools a little bit farther down the road. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>